Well hello again everybody. Well you can see we've actually got something a little bit different on the bench today. We've got a Stella television and in fact we're not even on the bench. We're actually on one of my workshop tables in my workroom because uh, unfortunately this television it's not so much the size although it is quite big. It's actually just too heavy to go on my bench so maybe in the next episode I'm gonna to have to do some bench reinforcing because unfortunately um, we can't get any test gear on here at the moment because we've got too many computers and other things lying around. Now I always say on these videos that I've got absolutely no idea what I'm doing and uh, generally that is quite true but it's especially true in this case because I've only ever worked on one television before which I think was something like a Bush TV 22 and I did actually quite a lot of work on that and then when I moved house the removal men managed to smash the tube on it so it's probably been ooh, it's more than 10 years since I've worked on a television and uh, I certainly wasn't very expert on them then. So as the label on top of the television says it was made by a company called Stella and that was a Stella Radio and Television Company Limited and their service department was located in Wadden Factory Estate, Croydon, Surrey. So apparently if we need some technical support we've just got to phone Croydon 722. And the model number of this television is ST1017U. Now the service information I have for these says that they were available in both 17 inch and a 21 inch. I'm just wondering where that was measured from. I don't know, that's about 15 inches. Do you measure them cross cornered? Well it's only 15 inches cross cornered. You wouldn't measure it like that surely because that's, I don't know, is that 21? It doesn't seem to fit any of those measurements. So I can see we've got some controls here so what can I see? Front and rear brightness. I'm not sure how, why you have front and rear brightness, I'm not sure. Also seems as though embedded in here is some kind of a volume switch. So this, this control seems to have two functions, brightness and volume. Yeah, I'm not sure what the front and rear is about. Looks like we've got the on and off switch here. Is that a press switch? Okay, that is some kind of press switch, so that's our power. And then I'm assuming that this clunky switch that must be a channel select so it looks like we've got one two well all the way around there to 12 so it looks like we could uh, select from a total of 12 channels there that seems quite hopeful for 1960 I'm not exactly sure I suspect there might have only been one station in 1960 maybe there was two I'm not exactly sure but uh, yeah having a 12 channel selector that does seem somewhat hopeful for the day doesn't it so it appears maybe at some point in the life of this set it's had a bash because this panel does seem somewhat loosey-goosey. Uh, not sure what's gone on there. Maybe we can put that back as part of the repair. So I think that the main purpose of today's video is really just to give you guys the chance to have a first look at this uh, television set because I, I, I do know so little about them and also just to give you the opportunity to leave some comments about well really what we should do with this television how we should go about powering it up for the first time now I've already started a thread on the UK Vintage Radio Restoration Forum in the television section where I've been asking for some help and advice for what is my first television and uh, there's quite a few comments in there already so what I plan to do is start working through some of those comments and really just doing what people are telling me to get me started with my first television but I'm hoping that you know a lot of you people who watch my videos some of you do come from the repair television trade I'm aware of that you've told me in the past so I'm hoping that you'll be familiar with this television set and you'll be able to just to pass on some advice to me. Now I'm sure that some of you are going to say why are you bothered to clean it at this stage we've got no idea if it works or not and of course I agree with you but I actually think there is some value in taking a little bit of time to clean something because when I'm actually carrying out this cleaning process I'm looking at everything I'm looking quite closely as I try to reach into all the little nooks and crannies and many times during this cleaning process I've actually spotted you know kind of a serious mistake that could actually cause damage or cause me a problem so just spend a little bit of time now even if this set turns out to be no good at all I won't regret having spent some time you know giving it a wipe over now the other thing is a lot of old valve equipment like this it just gets terribly dirty and dusty 
I do suffer quite badly from uh, asthma and uh, I don't like to have all that dust and dirt in the workshop and it makes the piece of equipment less pleasurable to work on. So for me I think it is quite important to give things you know a little bit of a scrub before we really even get started. So while I was just turning the set around the actual back panel just fell off because it's in pretty poor condition. It's uh, compressed fiberboard material and it's uh, yeah it's quite badly degraded so we'll maybe have to do some gluing and fixing on here assuming the set works. So it looks as though we've got on the back of this set some form of mains voltage selection. We've got a power connector that pokes through here with some male pins that poke through. Now I haven't got a power connector for this television yet but hopefully one of my friends is going to hook me up with that and send me a cable so we can actually plug this television in and give it a try. If we can't get a power connector of course we'll just have to kind of jury rig something up. What have we got here? Contrast, vertical, hold and height. They sound like some kind of magic television whisperer words that I'm afraid don't mean anything to me. Now because this is a vintage set the manufacturers have actually provided just a little bit of information here about it. So we've got some labels here, let's take a look at the first one. I can see we've got a little chart there identifying some of the valves that go into this thing. About the only one that I particularly recognise is that EF80 valve. Now I can also see a lot of valves that start with the prefix P. Now again I'm certainly no expert on TV valves but I seem to think valves with this P prefix were a higher voltage filament and they're particularly designed to be series strong. Now I can see also it's got a number there which says AW43 and AW53. Well they're telling us what sort of tube our television's got in it so I'll be quite interested to find out whether it was a 17 or a 21. Now we do have a, a tube tester here, again a piece of equipment which I bought many years ago but never actually had the opportunity to use so maybe we'll try and run that tube tester on it if I can figure out how to use a thing. And we've got another drawing shown in red which looks as though it's telling us how to get access to various internal components. Okay let's turn the TV round and take a closer look. So we can see we've got the mains connector that we mentioned earlier and uh, it looks as though it's got fuses in it so it says 1.5 amp mains fuse and also um, 0.25 amps HT. Now it looks as though both these fuses could be original so maybe that's a good sign that we've got no shenanigans going on. I can also see the manufacturer's information here which is stellar and the type was ST1017 U-46 and I'm guessing there's some kind of a batch number there 29153. So just above that main power connector I can see we've got our our contrast vertical hold and height. Well I remember certainly growing up back in the day you used to find things like your TV picture would be rolling or it wouldn't be framed properly on the screen and quite frequently your dad would lean over the back of the television set and uh, well after he'd thumped it a few times on the top he would probably adjust some of these things and uh, the picture would steady up until or well, probably until next time he switched it on when it started rolling again. So I'm guessing that these uh, switches here these potentiometers are something to do with that. So here's our mains voltage selector so we can turn that between 24250. Okay oh no you maybe you pull it. Do you pull it? You do it's a pull. So you pull this out and you can uh, you can turn it to whatever whatever voltage setting you want. That's very crusty. Let's give that a clean while we're at it. I've just squirted some switch cleaner on these pins so it can go back in with some switch cleaner on it. And of course it never hurts to check that you've got voltage selector switches set to the right position. So taking advice from some of the people on the Vintage Radio Restoration Forum they tell me that a lot of the capacitors on the components on here are actually pretty reliable. I can just see one of the uh, Plessy, one of these red and yellow stroke black capacitors. My experience those Plessy capacitors are always bad so we will go ahead and uh, we'll change that, that one out. Uh, I think the others are what, a lot of the others are what I would call mustard pot capacitors. They're generally quite reliable. 
So I can see we've got quite a few electrolytics here and the end caps on them look a bit dried up and shrunk so uh, those are those Dubalier brand ones so we'll probably go ahead and change them out because uh, generally I will change out electrolytic capacitors and I've also spotted we've got one of those brand new what do you call that a polypropylene one of these modern high voltage capacitors so certainly somebody's been here in the not too distant past and uh, done some work on it. So amazingly what we can do is we can actually lift this part of the chassis up, he said, and we can swing it out, he said, hopefully it won't drop off. Is that it? Does that swing out anymore? Okay, that may be it. So now we've swung the chassis open like some form of clamshell opening up, it's wonderfully accessible isn't it? Now of course I don't know anything about televisions but I'm guessing that this unit here is the tuner unit because it's connected to the main tuning controls. Now it looks as though this is the panel that's maybe got bent somewhere. Oh, it looks like the front controls and switches, they must uh, swivel round with it as well. I think you can just about see that in camera, so those main switches we were playing with earlier, the channel select and the volume control, they appear to actually move with the back panel. So there you, they get withdrawn into the set. Now I'm guessing that this panel here must be bent, the bracket or something, and that's why it doesn't line up properly now. Oh, it looks as though it's sprung. <laughs> Quite a neat little design feature that, isn't it? So this is the tuner unit. I'm guessing that inside here there's maybe what they would call a turret tuner. So at the bottom of the set here we've got what looks like two quite large power transformers. So I'm not exactly sure why we've got two separate transformers, I don't know. Hopefully you can see that under there we've got a big electrolytics and uh, again it's another Dubalier. Um, and it's definitely got multiple segments inside it, but I, I'm afraid it's too just too grubby to actually see what the writing is. I can also see a couple of large dropper resistors at the top made from this green porcelain material. And we can see that one of those dropper resistors has got a new resistor actually uh, tagged onto it. So I'm guessing that one of the sections on this dropper resistor must have gone open circuit at some point in the past and somebody's just replaced the burnt out section with a, with a new ceramic resistor there. Okay, and I can see inside this little cavity here, which I'm guessing is uh, is armoured because they don't want us accidentally putting our fingers in here and electrocuting ourselves. This is where the high voltage is generated, so I think they call that thing a line output transformer. And I seem to think that the uh, the out output voltage for this, I think I did check, I think it was re what I thought was relative high, maybe about 15,000 volts. Not exactly sure. And of course, because it's one of those high voltage components, it's actually absolutely thick with with dust and dirt. So, although I don't, I'm always worried about you know damaging something. It can't help the fact that this thing is just covered in dust. So I think we will go ahead, and I'm going to over that out as well because uh, it's making me nose itch. It's making me sneeze. Well, I don't think the vacuum did a great job of getting in there and this paintbrush is maybe a little bit too big so I think what I'll do is off camera I'm going to clean that up a little bit more using a smaller soft brush that I can get in here and get rid of some of the dirt. So we're just looking at the bottom of the tube here and I can see we've got this little spring arrangement. Now my understanding is this is actually the main grounding for the CRT and these can cause problems because if they don't make proper contact with the back of the CRT here the whole of the back of this tube can become live and obviously that could be quite dangerous so I think this is something we probably need to just make sure is clean and that actually it's making a good contact. So as you can see this tube is absolutely thick with horrible dust which is making me itch and sneeze. So I think what I'll do is I'm going to try and vacuum and brush as much of it the dust off as I can and then I'm just going to take a damp rag. Now I'm sure it's probably not a good idea to get a lot of HT stuff wet but I'm not planning on powering this up today and again I don't think all this dirt and dust can be doing any good. So I've just noticed at the back of the CRT there's one of these, I don't know, what do you call it, a linear potentiometer, it's one of those rails and it's got some carbon deposit on it or something like that and you slide the little wiper up and down to set the resistance of it. But I can see at some point in the past one of the actual, one side of the potentiometer, it looks like it's been cut, the wire on it has been cut away there. Hopefully you can see that. I'm, uh, I'm just wondering why somebody's done that. I'm not even sure what that control does. Um, if you know what that is, maybe leave it in the comments or if you know why it's been cut. I'm sure it's not always a good idea to get things wet like this, especially around things like 
line output and transforms but I'm afraid just because of my asthma and stuff I have to try to remove as much dust as I can because otherwise I will be coughing for weeks. Taking a close look at the back of the CRT does that look like a, a tube that's been run a lot? I don't know they do say that they're meant to burn a lot around here haven't they when they've got a lot of hours on them now that doesn't look particularly burnt to me it doesn't really look burnt at all but I've got to admit some of these valves in here look incredibly burnt so this Mollard EF85 valve it's almost totally black at the top of the envelope I mean at least it's not gassed at least it's not white inside which is always worse but I don't actually think I've seen a, a tube which is quite as black as that maybe televisions run a bit more power and uh, hence they get a bit hotter again not sure leave it in the comments don't even know what that does I also notice we've got some little slidey things on here do they do something important one well, probably shouldn't adjust so should they oh well okay just notice this little plug thing it looks like it's on the back of the line output transformer Looks as though it pulls out. Is that on setting three? Looks like it goes one, two, three, max four. Got no idea what that does. Do you know? Leave it in the comments. Got another connector plug here. Does that pull out? Again, not exactly sure. Better not pull on it. Might come off in my hand. So it looks like this set is almost constructed in lots of little separate chassis. There's certainly about four of them. Now I'm wondering is that just a manufacturing thing or is it if I undo some of these screws do these chassis flip out or again pivot round so you can get access to stuff. Again if you've worked on these televisions back in the day uh, leave it in the comments. So I think this is our audio output transformer at the top here and again I can see that this has got one of those uh, is that Hunt's capacitor the ones that are covered in tar. Well just feeling it it feels, feels very spongy and it's got cracks in it so yeah, note to self, we'll probably have to replace that one as well. Just notice that the support bracket, which is actually holding this radio chassis in, is actually broken at the top here. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to have to watch that. That could break off very easily, and I'm guessing the whole top chassis would then <laughs> drop onto the floor, which would be bad. So going back to the place we started I can see the mains connector here and it does appear to be uh, polarised because it's like a V-shaped. I'm wondering if this is a, a live chassis set, I'm not exactly sure, haven't had a close look at the drawings yet. See if the power switch is on. Well, since we're getting a very high reading there between these uh, pins of the mains connector, I was just trying to check to see if it was a live chassis. It's coming up as a very high reading at the moment of something like uh, 66 kilo ohms, something like that. That doesn't strike me as being right. So I've just had a quick look at a circuit diagram now, and it does actually appear that this set maybe does use a uh, potentially a live chassis with this neutral wire connected to the chassis but I wasn't getting a reading before but I'm just looking at the wire and uh, well it looks as though it's almost been snipped through. Certainly I can see our black wire, our neutral here, it looks as though somebody's had a pair of side cutters on that. It looks like there was two wires. One wire has clearly been cut. I wonder if there was a, an across the mains capacitor there, I'm not exactly sure. So it looks like a couple of wires have been cut and this black one has almost been snipped off in its entirety. Could do with tracing this black wire to see if it actually does go to the chassis. Well it looks like the first thing we're going to have to have a go at repairing is actually our mains power switch. It seems quite a convoluted affair. It's actually driven from a, a long linkage which goes to right to the front of the set. So it's that thing there if you can see it. And uh, it does seem to operate occasionally. But, it, but it's, it's very intermittent. What I'm doing, I'm just applying pressure to the switch. So that's working now. Okay, so yeah, we've got a duff switch there. We're going to have to figure out a repair to that. But we have just confirmed that this is a, a live chassis set. Well, I don't know about you, but I've really been struggling to find things to bang my knees on recently. Luckily, I've got the perfect solution. And for absolutely no extra charge, it comes with this absolutely free elbow banger. Well, that feels a bit more sturdy. Ben, Jake, the 
extra leg, diddly, diddly, diddly. Well, with the help of that extra leg, we've been able to put the television on the workbench and actually start to take a closer look at it and do some of the little repair jobs. Well, apparently it can be quite a problem to get these light output transformers to quirk or tribulate. So what we've got, we've got ahead and we've actually connected the overwinding to my power supply here. And oh, I can't keep that up very long. So as you can see, we've got ahead and we've connected up the overwind on this line output transformer here to my power supply. And if I actually touch it here, it's actually just warm to the touch because apparently one of the big failure modes of these line output transformers if they get any kind of uh, dampness inside them they flash over and the uh, the windings can short circuit internally and that tends to finish them off now a lot of people have said that the line output transformers on this particular model of television were quite unreliable but having read a number of uh, things online it appears that pretty much all line output transformers are a major source of problems and in fact these line output transformers failed even when televisions were relatively new so after 60 years it's not surprising that they fail but we're going to give it every chance so before I connected the power supply I went ahead and I measured the resistance between the top cap of the line output valve and also the top cap of the uh, rectifier valve and the resistance reading was about 100 ohms so if you take that 100 ohms of winding resistance and you put 15 volts across it you're going to end up with dissipating about 2 watts and that just makes it just slightly hot just to, it can keep your finger on it without it burning me or anything like that I would estimate it's probably around I don't know just over 40 degrees so the idea is we're going to keep my power supply connected for three or four days maybe up to a week and this heat which we're putting into this winding here the idea is it's going to dry it's going to force any moisture out of it so hopefully when we do switch the television on it stands more of a chance of working now so far I've only done some very basic checks on our television and uh, to be quite honest I've got no idea whether it's going to work or not but I think what I will do is I'm just going to throw caution to the wind and I'm going to be hopeful that this is a winner and it's going to work and uh, because of that I'm going to start to change some of these other components in the anticipation that everything will be fine which of course will probably almost certainly seal my fate because that's the way things work isn't it but we may as well start off by uh, replacing some of these horrible hunts capacitors because well they're always bad aren't they so why not let's do that it's always painful isn't it trying to uh, to get things off tag strips now often the writing can be very difficult to read on some of these old capacitors but if you just squirt a little bit of service oil or something like that onto them it kind of just jumps out at you although once you've done that it does go kind of more tarry and sticky so you've only got a limited amount of time to read it so it does seem like for some reason they actually decide to actually put all the values for these in a peak of farads and I think this one says I think that looks like 1000 so it looks like 18,000, yeah I think that's 18,000 picofarad and that's gone a bit high because it's actually measuring 25 nanofarads so what we'll do is we'll go ahead and uh, we'll probably put I think the nearest value I've got in is, is probably about 22 nanofarads so that's probably what we'll put in there this capacitor I think it was rated at 600 volts I think it's written, written on the Yep, 600 volts. Shall we see what it measures in a resistance test? Okay, and that's measuring 0.7 mega ohms at 500 volts. Well, it's a 600 volt working capacitor, so obviously we'd expect it to be a lot better. Than so I think this capacitor's rated, I can just about see it's rated at 630 volts, 22 nanofarad. Let's give that a test at 500 volts. And of course the uh, resistance of that is infinite because it's not leaking. So I'm going to take a guess that if that uh, capacitor was bad, if there's any more of these uh, tar filled capacitors in there, they're going to be bad as well I would have thought. Now I can also see we've got one of those Plessy capacitors down here and I've got to say my experience of these are uh, Plessy capacitors, well, it's it's all bad. What was this one? This one was uh, 100 microfarads at 12 volts. 
let's just cut one end and give it a test. Okay, so it's measuring 143 because the failure mode of a lot of electrolytics is to go high in value. Do you want to see an ESR reading? I'm sure you do. Okay, so that's coming up on here on this uh, peak atlas meter is 109 microfarads, so it's a slightly different capacitance reading, it's closer to what it should be, but the ESR value is 15.9 ohms. Well, I would have thought that um, actually for something like this, a 12 volt, 100 microfarad, I'm probably going to go for a number like something like 1 or 2 ohms. So yeah, 15 ohms is far too high for ESR. So that's another bad one. And uh, as you go through these capacitors, and it doesn't really matter which ones you try, you kind of get a feel for what's good and what's bad. And uh, I'm sorry to say, I think what we're going to find is probably all the electrolytics will be bad. And um, if we don't change them out now, we would almost certainly be changing them out in the future. So I've watched several of Shangu's videos now, which of course makes me somewhat of an expert in televisions. And uh, I've got some, I always used to laugh at his blue gloves that he used to be wearing. He seems to have started wearing gloves more recently. And uh, he says it's because of all the dirt and crud that's in these old television sets. Well, I only put these on for a little bit of a joke actually, but I actually can see some utility. When you actually look at how dirty these gloves have become in a very short time, you kind of do wonder what you're touching. Now I'm going to really spoil it by putting one of these uh, very nice and somewhat expensive Vichy capacitors in it. Now the main reason I'm going to do that is simply because a lot of the uh, smaller capacitors that I've got, the ones that are correct for a 12 volt rating, they're little tiny things and the uh, length of the legs isn't long enough so it's going to get treated with a 50 volt capacitor even though it's only rated for 12. Now we've also got a dodgy broken main switch and it's a double pole switch but it's a neutral side that isn't working so I think what I'm going to do rightly or wrongly is I'm actually just going to uh, bridge this new wire that I'm going to install to the to the closed side of the switch what would be closed and uh, I'm going to worry about fixing the switch later because I think the switch might actually be one of the harder things to repair and get at so yeah, I'm going to come back and do that. Assuming the TV works, what I'll probably do is I'll probably take the switch off, dismantle it, and uh, see what we can do to fix it. See if there is anything we can do to fix it. So we can definitely see some signs of butchery inside here. We've actually got a couple of wires here which have been, well, quite savagely just cut off actually. And actually some wires just very poorly wrapped round each other. So it almost looks like these uh, two wires that have been cut off. If I, well, it's actually three wires have been cut off because this one is only hanging on by a thread. And I bet I could just... There we go. <laughs> That's disconnected totally now. So for some reason, somebody had cut through these wires. So it, it kind of makes me wonder <laughs> if the story I got from this seller of it all working was <laughs> quite as accurate because... Uh, Somebody cut that wire through in the past and there's the remains of some other wiring which is, well the other wires are just wrapped round, they're not even um, soldered on properly. I think I can probably just unwind that, there we go. So yeah, there's signs of uh, lots of hackery gone on. I think we're going to have to try and sort that out a little bit. Okay, before I go ahead and turn the television set round, I've made up a little girly list of things to do here. So we have detached wire on the mains plug. So we've addressed that. Um, CRT focus control wire cut. I don't even remember earlier, really, there was a wire cut that went on, on the back of one of the sliding potentiometers that was at the back of the tube. Apparently that's a proper service engineer's bodge. It was something to do with um, something not right with the focus control resistors getting hot or burning out. So it used to cause the size of the picture to collapse. So apparently uh, service engineers, rather than doing a proper repair, which wouldn't last long, what they would do is they cut one end off the earthy leg off the end of the potentiometer and that would restore the picture to full height. So that's a accredited service engineer's bodge that was done back in the day. So I don't need to worry about that. A uh, capacitor on the back of the brightness control. Okay, there's a capacitor hanging off the back of the brightness control, which I've noticed. 
but on closer inspection it's also been cut off and it's not original so at the moment I'm not going to worry about that. Uh, output transformer or oh, audio output transformer uh, tar covered hunts okay so we've seen that we've just changed that out broken switch internal damage so it looks like the neutral side of our double pole switch is stuffed okay well we're going to link that out with this piece of wire at the moment temporarily and if the set works we'll do a proper repair on the switch got a broken hinge okay top of the cabinet is is broken or loose i'm not sure which it is but certainly there's something something not right going on up there yeah i can see the wood is broken away so i don't exactly know what i can do to fix that but certainly i'm scared that probably at some critical moment i'm going to have this chassis swung out this hinge is going to give way and the whole live assembly is going to drop onto my love potatoes so we need to sort that out now I have it on good authority that the 2.7 mega ohm anode load resistor which goes high and should be changed apparently it's fed from the PLC 83 fed from boost rail. So of course most of this is written in this television whisperer's special language so I've got no idea what that means or where it is. Uh, replace lop valve capacitor. Mm, don't know what that is. Uh, apparently got to replace a boost capacitor, don't know what that is. Uh, dry out the lot. Okay, so we've got the lot drying at the moment. We're passing some current through it and it's getting warm and toasty. We're going to leave it cooking for a few days. Final thing I'm going to do today, I'm going to solder that wire back onto the back of the switch and then I'm going to call it done until next time. Yeah, all very dodgy as you can see. <laughs> Don't really have the space to be doing televisions and this isn't even a particularly big television. Okay, don't worry, I'm going to move you. I know you want to see what's going on. So effectively, I'm just connecting the neutral wire permanently to the chassis. Now I'm guessing that the uh, designers, the original manufacturers, the reason they've done it like they, were, they originally did it is they were always concerned that if they'd use single pole switch in a single pole switch, one of the conductors would have been connected to the chassis and there is some possibility that the set could have been switched off but because there was only a switch in one line in either the neutral or the live supply this chassis could have been left live so as a safety feature they've used double pole switching and of course that's what we will do when we put it back I'm not too bothered about that for testing purposes because what I'm going to be doing is when I'm when I'm working on this or when I want to put my hands inside it I'm going to remove the plug from the socket so to make sure that the set is totally isolated because that's how I work on mains gear anyway I never rely on switches because switches can often be defeated or not work properly so yeah you don't want to rely on switches in valve equipment when you when you're working on it and you've got your hands inside it best thing to do is physically unplug it that's a safe thing to do Okay, that is just tacked on there a little bit loosely, but again, this is only for test purposes, that'll do for now. Well, since I've been in here and give everything a clean, I think I can actually make out the writing on the side of this big electrolytic. And it does look like it's one of these multi-section affairs. So we've got red section 100 microfarads at 250 volts, yellow section 250 microfarads at 250 volts, and green section is 10 microfarads at 250 volts. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to try to measure the uh, the SR on these. I don't know if we'll do it with it in circuit. We might, we may or may not be able to do it with that in circuit. Let's go ahead and give it a go. Okay, let's go ahead and just test the red section first. So the red section should be 100 microfarads and it's actually coming up as uh, 300 microfarads. Um, that doesn't seem right to me, although maybe some of the sections are paralleled up somewhere in circuit. I'm not sure, that seems a little high, but the ESR is, is good. Well, I say a little high, it's three times the value it should be. Let's just put one of the other uh, sections in. Let's try the yellow section, which should be... Yellow should be 250. Let's see what that comes up as. 
Okay, so the yellow's coming up as 300, so that looks a bit more like it. I'd expect maybe 250 to 300, that's fine. The ESR's low again, 0.3, so nothing wrong with that. Can we get on the final section? Final section says it should be 10 microfarad. Okay, it's not reading on that, it says in circuit leaky, so it's maybe being loaded by something within circuit. So I think what I'll do is I'm going to have a look at the uh, service information, the schematic. I'm going to work out what voltage is on these electrolytics, and although I suspect this, this television may have been turned on in the last few years, I'll probably just connect a DC power supply to it, and I'll try and run it up with whatever the service sheet indicates the rail voltage is at, I'll start very low and I'll maybe turn it up over a day or so. Uh, at least when they see some DC for the first time it won't come as a total shock to them then. Well I think I've flapped my mouth enough for one episode. So next time I'm going to be channeling my inner Shangu and we're going to have a go at powering this set up for the first time. So I'm very interested to see and hear all of your comments and if you've got any hints or tips for me I look forward to reading them. So until next time that'll do. Thanks very much. Bye bye for now.